morning, one and all, and those of you out in Zoom land. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Nathan uh, Havel. I'm thinking, pronounce that right? Yeah, research entomologist with USDA Forest Service. Uh, so Nathan got his uh, bachelor's uh, at the College of William and Mary. Um, we'll give the year. Then he uh, went to the University of Wisconsin and got his uh, first master's in entomology. Then he went to Yale and got his second master's in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. And then he finished up in Yale in 2006 with his PhD. His research is focused on the systematics and population genetics of hemlock woolly adelgid, balsam woolly adelgid, gypsy moth, and winter moth. And not only that, but he's looking at the systematics and population genetics of the predators and parasitoids that are being evaluated as biological control agents, including those of hemlock, woolly adelgid, and emerald ash borer. His long-term goal is to help reconstruct the evolutionary history of multiple trophic levels of a pest system to guide management and to mitigate the impact of invasive insect pests on forest ecosystems in the Northeastern United States. He's especially concerned uh, with research related to classical biological control to develop practical cost-effective tools used to evaluate the safety and efficacy of predators and parasitoids, uh, which have been introduced. Lastly, I'd like to say, I really just met Nathan the first time uh, yesterday, the day before. He's a really nice guy who's very easy to talk to and loves talking about his stuff and things that you can understand. So let's please give a warm CAS welcome to Dr. Avell. All right, great, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate the invitation to come talk to you all. Let me try to get this moving along here. Okay, so yeah, as, uh, as my title said, I'm gonna talk about kind of the current status of hemlock woolly adelgid biological control. Um, and I wanna make sure I, up front, I, uh, talk about some of my collaborators. It's, this is really uh, an effort that includes federal, state, university um, people involved. It's just some of the, the uh, organizations that are involved in this work. And I want to especially uh, thank Mark Whitmore at Cornell and Bud Mayfield, Dave Mozell, and Talbot Trotter, who's here in the audience, uh, with the Forest Service, and also Joe Elkington and Ryan Crandall at UMass, who provided some of the material and slides that I'm going to be presenting. So just a little introduction to who I am and who I work with for some of the folks that might not know. Uh, so I work right down the street in Hamden. We're part of the Forest Service Northern Research Station. So we are the largest group within Forest Service Research and Development. And the uh, geographic area that we cover covers 20 different states. You can see the map there of forest cover in the north, northern region um, and about 170 million acres of forest. Uh, this region also has about 40% of the U.S. inhabitants and, of course, many of the largest U.S. cities. It's also a region that has more non-native forest pests than any other region in the United States. You can see here, this is from a study from Sandy Leopold et al. back in 2013, and you can see that the Northeast is an area where we have um, a very high density of non-native species, non-native forest pests. And the reason for this is probably just because we have such a high population density. In this area, lots of opportunities for people to bring stuff in, and also a high diversity of tree species in this area, so lots of habitat that can be invaded by different pests. So the particular work unit that myself and Talbot work for is uh, called NRS03, it's the, and our um, focus is the ecology and management of invasive species and forest ecosystems. So we're spread over three different locations. We have locations in East Lansing, Michigan, Morgantown, West Virginia, and of course in Hamden. Uh, we have eight scientists in our unit um, and three of us are in Hamden. So there's Dr. Trotter, who's a research ecologist, Dr. Melody Kina, who's a research entomologist, and myself, who's also a research entomologist. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, my particular focus is using molecular systematics and population genetics to study these different trophic levels of, and uh, related to invasive species. So some of the kinds of things I've worked on, uh, I did a phylogeny of hemlock of, of the genus Suga. I've done uh, systematics or population genetics of species like hemlock woolly adelgid, balsam woolly adelgid, spongy moth, winter moth, and southern pine beetle. And also I've been focusing quite a bit on predators and parasitoids 
that are being evaluated and or used for biological controlled agents, especially if hemlock really adelgid, which of course is what I'll talk about today. So an introduction to the main character of this talk, hemlock really adelgid, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with it. It's been around for a while in Connecticut, very serious pest. And I just wanted to highlight some of the forest impacts that it has. So we know it impacts light regimes, uh, nutrient cycling and stream flow, uh, tree species composition. Um, it impacts, of course, associated flora and fauna and aesthetics. So if we're losing hemlock in the forest and also in urban settings, uh, it has a serious impact um, on uh, aesthetics. And also, this is the latest map. Um, those of you who have seen talks about hemlock really adelgid over the years have probably seen various versions of this map showing the range of eastern hemlock in green and uh, the latest uh, counties that have been infested with hemlock really adelgid. And it continues to spread. There have been recent uh, spread up into Nova Scotia, making inroads into Ontario. It jumped over to western Michigan. So it is continuing to spread into that area of eastern hemlock. The, the southern part of hemlock's range is pretty much already all infested. So back in 2013, just to give a little history of uh, the work that's been done and that I've been involved with the hemlock lily adelgid, in 2003, an initiative was formed that, that was supposed to foster a coordinated approach to solve this problem. So it includes managers and scientists from federal, state, university, tribal, international, and private entities. Uh, and it has a steering committee and a coordinating committee that kind of um, give input about the direction of what this uh, what this uh, initiative could be working on. This shows the current members of those. There won't be a test at the end, but just to show that it's a, it's a group of people from Forest Service, APHIS, um, other organizations like the National Association of State Foresters um, that are all involved in trying to um, set the, the uh, direction for this initiative to try to control the adelgid. We also have an annual program managers meeting, which is a meeting of all the folks that are out in the field try, working to try to control it. So a lot of state um, folks. And we also have an annual biological control working group meeting where we get together and talk about the latest science and, and management options for using biological control. Uh, the, these uh, committees also come up with a five-year strategic plan and the latest strategic plan was just put out in 2021. It covers up until 2025. So some of the changes in this new strategic plan compared to uh, the last plan, which ended in 2018, there was a little gap between that one and, and the current one. Um, and, and some of these things will make more sense later on as I go through my talk, is an increased emphasis on in integrated pest management, developing silver flies as biocontrols, increased emphasis on silviculture and restoration, and increased emphasis on resistance breeding in hemlock. Um, things that they're gonna reduce emphasis on are methods development and research for Laracobia species, some other, another group of uh, predators for biocontrol, and also reduced emphasis on looking at hemlock really adelgid biology and economic in impact assessments because there's been already quite a bit of work that's been done on that. So I'm gonna talk um, about one of those approaches, so biological control and the national strategy for biological control. The approach of course is classical biological control, which is a reminder is looking uh, at what's feeding on the pest in its native range and introducing those predators into the introduced range. The goal is a permanent self-sustaining suppression of the adelgid. Um, below damaging levels throughout the Eastern US. So that's a pretty lofty goal. And the objectives, kind of the more immediate objectives of doing that are to release a suite of predators that target different parts of the adelgid life cycle. And we wanna have robust monitoring of establishment and impacts. And then also as these predators become more abundant, the ones become established, we can actually start re redistributing those uh, throughout the landscape to other areas where they're not yet established. So I'm going to touch on a lot of these um, as I go along. So this uh, national strategy, uh, these are the predators that are currently um, in the mix, the ones that we're working with. Uh, one strange thing about adelgids is that where there are no parasitoids of any adelgid species known, which is a very strange thing for a group of insects. 
So, uh, so we're stuck with working with specialist predators in this system. So there are two species native to Japan, Sasaji skin and Sugi, which is a uh, lady beetle and a, a deridontid beetle, a predator beetle from, that's called Laracobius osakensis. And there are three species native to Western North America, Laracobius nigrinus, which is another deridontid, and two species of silver flies, Leucotraxis argenticolis and Leucotraxis pinnaperda. So why are we looking at Japan and Western North America? So uh, a little while back, we started doing some genetics of the adelgid itself. And this shows some of the results of a more recent study that was published in 2016, where we use mitochondrial DNA sequences and 14 microsatellite loci. We had samples from Eastern and Western North America, China, Taiwan, and Japan. So we really tried to get the whole range of hemlock adelgids around the world. And we found using both of those sets of markers that there are separate lineages, very separate lineages in those different places. So in China, there are two distinct lineages. Taiwan, there are two. Japan, there are two lineages. And there's a separate lineage in Western North America. We found that the uh, adelgids that are here in Eastern North America came directly from Southern Japan. Uh, and we also found surprisingly that in Western North America, the adelgid is, was not introduced as was uh, previously thought. It's actually native to Western North America. So that lineage in the West is closely related to the Japanese adelgid that we got here in the East, but it is distinct. And when we do some molecular dating, we think probably that that came over from Asia about 36,000 years ago um, before the last uh, glacial maximum. So we have in Western North America, adelgids that have been there for a long time. And then we have in Eastern North America, our invasive adelgids that came somewhere around 70 to 100 years ago, right from Japan. So that made us think, well, maybe there are some native natural enemies in the West that have evolved with hemoclea adelgid for a relatively long time that might be good um, candidates for biological control. So a little bit more about the adelgids biology to kind of frame um, the, the control. We know in Japan um, that the adelgid can either have holocyclic populations, which means they have these two generations only on hemlock, and they can produce these winged forms, which would fly out looking for a primary host. And a primary host is always spruce in adelgids. And uh, in particular, uh, for hemlock lily adelgid, the primary host is tiger tail spruce, which is type Picea torano, which is native to Japan. Um, so when that primary host is present, you can get these other generations on spruce, which includes the one sexual generation in the whole life cycle, and also gall formation. So this is what one of those galls look like. It's, it's a very unique kind of gall, even within adelgids. It's, it's, this one's about golf ball size, and you can get uh, about 1,200 adelgids flying out of that gall. Um, and this shows uh, this winged form that flies over to spruce and lays the uh, sexual generation, which you can see under her wings right there. So that's what's going on in Japan. You could have different populations, either anholocyclic or holocyclic, depending on whether that spruce is present. And we know in North America, we only have anholocyclic um, uh, life cycles. So we have those two generations. Um, one generation lays the eggs in the summer. Um, they have an estivation period throughout most of the summer. They do most of their developing in the winter and then they're laying eggs in early spring. So that generation, I'm gonna call the summer generation. Um, it's also called the cystens generation, which comes from the word to stay. Cystens means stay, so it refers to that estimation period. And then there's another generation. Um, their eggs are laid uh, in early spring, in the winter in the South, uh, and they develop very quickly. They don't have an estimation period. So that's, I'm gonna call that the spring generation or sometimes it's referred to as the progredience generation, which means it progresses. It doesn't have that um, estivation period. And these winged forms that fly out in North America, they don't have anywhere to go because we don't have a, a suitable spruce species. So that's the source of mortality. So any of those that, that uh, are formed at that point in the life cycle and fly away, um, they don't survive. And those are called sexuperi. So I, I might mention that uh, word later on too. So let's meet some of these uh, predators that have been released. Uh, this is Sasaji skimnus sugi. It's native to Southern Japan. Uh, we know it feeds on all life stages of the hemlock lily adelgid. It has very high fecundity and a long lifespan. Um, the first releases were done in, two, in 1995 right here in Connecticut. 
and it's relatively easy to mass rear. So labs started rearing it here in Connecticut at the Ag Station in New Jersey, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And to date, more than 5 million of these beetles have been released um, throughout the landscape. So this is a map showing where those releases and recoveries have taken place. I'm gonna show a bunch of these maps. And you can see that the um, blue squares are release sites and the purple circles are um, sites where they've been recovered uh, over the landscape. So it's been released very broadly over the landscape and there have been recoveries. Unfortunately, those post-release recoveries have been sporadic and at very low numbers. So for example, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, um, over 500,000 beetles were released between 2002 and 2012 at 150 different sites. Um, 65 of those sites that were investigated in, in this study from 2004 to 2012, they found only 614 uh, beetles in total at only 13 different sites. Unfortunately, also, there's no concrete evidence of population level impact on HWA after release of this beetle. And it's really not clear why their numbers are so low uh, after release, despite performing so well in the lab. So I'm going to switch gears a little and start talking about some of these predators from Western North America. Um, this shows uh, the results of a survey that was published in 2008 of predators that are found feeding on hemlock bully adelgid in the West. And you can see that the two um, most abundant groups are Deridontidae, which consisted of just this one species, Laracobius nigrinus, and the Camiomyidae, which are the silver flies. And that consisted of these two species that I mentioned earlier, also Laracobius or Leucotaraxis argenticolis and Leucotaraxis pinnaperta. So it was really these two groups of predators um, that became the focus of looking for potential biocontrols from the West to release into the East. So Laracobius nigrinus, uh, this is a beetle that feeds on the adelgid in Western North America, as I said. It's a winter and spring feeder. So it's also dormant throughout the summer, uh, like the adelgid is. And it does almost all of its feeding on these eggs in the spring. Um, it was first released in North Carolina back in 2003. And there's been a lot of mass rearing going on where it was very successful at labs in various places. And to date about 400,000 of those have been released. And this again shows a map of where those have been released and recovered. So it's been released very widely throughout the range of hemlock willy adelgid in the east. And it's been uh, recovered in quite a bit of places too. So it is widely established and it is actually locally abundant in some locations. We have found that uh, it does establish better in warmer areas, um, but there are sites where there are enough beetles out there, uh, we call these field insectaries, um, where you can go and collect thousands of beetles and release them in other places. So for example, down in North Carolina, this is, these are the numbers from this last year, there are about 10,000 adults that were collected and then released in other locations in North Carolina where it hasn't been established yet. Um, since 2008, about 155,000 have been moved around. So now we're at a point with this beetle that uh, we don't really have to do very much lab rearing anymore. We can just start moving it around the landscape um, from these high density locations. So when we started looking at Laracobius, especially when we were um, taking a look at a new species that was discovered in Japan, this Laracobius osakensis, we decided to do a molecular phylogeny of the genus. And coming out of that, we found that Laracobius nigrinus, this Western species is very closely related to a native Eastern species called Laracobius rubidus. So this result, uh, plus some folks were seeing the two species mating in the field, made us wonder whether these two species could hybridize when you bring the Western species into the East. So just as a reminder, there's Laracobius nigrinus, which is native to Western North America. Um, this species prefers hemlock adelgids to pine adelgids. And Laracobius rubidus, our native Eastern deridontid beetle, um, this one prefers pine adelgids to hemlock. And you can tell them apart, one is red, one is black, that's the name. Um, and this, these are the genitalia that are used to um, distinguish the species by the, the angle of the parameters there. <laughs> So we collected samples from uh, both species in areas where uh, 
that were non-release sites, so areas where it was presumed that uh, only one or the other species um, existed, and then also from a bunch of release sites here in the east, these um, red triangles. And indeed, we found that they are hybridizing. So this just shows a PCA of those genotypes based on micro microsatellite loci. Um, and you can see that the non-release sites are solid uh, symbols, and the release sites are the ones with the outline, and hybrids are um, squares. So yes, yeah, you can see that in release sites, we did find a mix of both species, peer species, and hybrids. So there was a good amount of concern about this, you know, what, what impact we were having by releasing this Western species that's hybridizing with the native species. Um, fortunately, since then, there have been a bunch of studies that are listed here that uh, looked at rates of hybridization between these species. And these are the various locations where the sites are and the number of individuals that were tested. And you can see kind of remarkably that the percent hybridization on hemlock was really stable over time, around 11 to 13%. And then uh, there was a recent study, just Jub et al. 2020, where they found only 2% hybridization on hemlock. So we're kind of wondering what's going on here. We, we had originally hypothesized that it would probably end up being a stable mosaic hybrid zone. So basically hybridization going on at different places across the landscape, but that level of hybridization was going to remain stable. But it looks like what might be happening, this hint with the lower hybridization rate, that maybe there is reinforcement going on in this system, which refers to the evolution of stronger reproductive isolation evolving over time if the hybrids are less fit than the parents. So we're hoping to be able to follow up on this um, with some genomic studies. So just a, a summary of what we know about Laracobius hybridization. So we know it's occurring. It's occurring very broadly across the landscape, but these, the low hybridization percent um, has been stable and maybe decreasing over time. Um, and also pure uh, nigrinus and pure rubidus are being maintained on their preferred prey. So more um, nigrinus on hemlock adelgids, more rubidus on pine adelgids. And maybe this is because of their specialized behaviors to locate their prey using host plant cues. So there was an olfactometer study that found that yes, nigrinus is more attracted to hemlock and rubidus is more attracted to pine. So they may just not be finding each other in the field that much. So the next species I'm gonna switch back to Japan is Laracobius osakensis, which is another beetle that has very similar biology to um, Laracobius nigrinus. It's native to Japan, of course. Um, it also is a winter spring feeder. It feeds at that same point in the life cycle of the adelgid. And research at Virginia Tech um, showed that this species may be even more fecund and eat more adelgids than nigrinus. They, they did some uh, lab and field studies uh, to look at those rates. Uh, we know it does not hybridize with either of the North American species. Um, and there is currently some mass rearing going on at labs in Virginia and Tennessee, and they've been releasing it. Um, it's, and about 40,000 have been released down from North Carolina up to Maine, and it is establishing pretty well. Um, so much so that at a site in Pennsylvania, they're able to collect about 1,600 adults and redistribute those to other sites already. So again, this shows uh, where they've been released and they've been recovered. They're also, this, just this past year, we recovered up in coastal Maine, which is not shown on that map. So it is, uh, does seem to be um, establishing pretty well. So what about impact of Laracobius? Um, there have been a few studies now uh, that have shown, have studied what the actual impact on adelgid numbers are of Laracobius nigrinus, which is out there. Again, at these sites where there are enough beetles out there, that you can do um, predator exclusion studies. You can put uh, mesh bags on some branches, um, which would keep the predators out and then leave other branches exposed. And this one study that was published in 2015, uh, they found that the density of hemocoli adulgent in April on caged shoots, so these are um, caged and exposed, uh, was about twice that of exposed shoots. So it does seem like uh, at least this, on this first generation of adelgids, the beetle is having an impact. However, other studies, another study that followed the uh, impact of uh, Laracobius nigrinus longer in the life cycle of the adelgid, found just what the title says, rebound. So the, adel the adelgid was able to rebound in the next generation following predation on that first generation. 
So um, just to kind of say what they summarize, what they found that despite high rates of predation on the uncaged branches compared to caged branches, um, there was no significant difference in subsequent densities of the spring generation between caged and uncaged treatments. So why might this be? Um, so this is also another study that, that Talbot here has been working on with uh, another colleague, Joe Alkington at UMass. And they're working out a simulation of adelgid population dynamics. So that's what all this is. And they're using um, data from field populations of the adelgid for various density dependent parameters. So for example, and this is from uh, Annie Paradis. She was a, a student at um, UMass from her dissertation. Uh, she found that the fewer adelgids you have, the better they reproduce and the better they survive in the next generation. So the adelgid life cycle is filled with these density dependent um, impacts of based on population density at lots of different parts in that life cycle. So Talbot and, and Joe have put this into a, a simulation. Can I just move that ahead? And uh, I just want you to focus on this upper left panel here. So this is, and these lines show the, the population density of the two different adelgid uh, generations. And so this is with no impact, no feeding on any life cycle of the adelgid. You can plug in um, feeding of different life, uh, different life stages of the adelgid into this model. So this is with no feeding, you can just see that the adelgid densities go right along. This is with eating 99% of the eggs of that spring generation. So even after eating 99% of the eggs, the density dependent feedback is so strong that you barely get any impact on the overall adelgid numbers. Now, if we add 99% of feeding on the spring generation, plus 90, in this case, it's 95% of feeding on the, of the eggs of the summer generation, we get them crashing. So again, this is just a simulation, um, a nice model to be able to plug these numbers into, but it seems like something like this is probably happening in the field that we really have to get sustained feeding on both of those generations of the adelgid to have um, effective control. There's another recent study that found a very similar um, kind of takeaway message. Uh, and this was a predator impact study in Western North America that was done by graduate student uh, Ryan Crandall. And again, with Joe, our collaborator, Joe Elkington at UMass. This was another predator exclusion study. And this was done in the West at Washington Park Arboretum. And they could actually study uh, the effects on Eastern hemlock and Western hemlock. So it was done in an arboretum. Um, stopped advancing. Did I hit something? Oh, there it goes, okay. Uh, so what they did was they artificially inoculated uh, trees with hemlock woolly adelgid so they could have starting uh, densities that were about the same. And like the other studies in the east, they put mesh bags on half the branches and left the other half open to predators. Um, and then they compared the densities of the adelgid on branches with and without bags. And this is what they found. They followed them over, over time and sampled at different times. And they found that at all the different sampling times, Yes, the, the number of adelgids in exposed branches were lower than those in um, enclosed branches. And so this is showing that there's um, strong evidence of top-down control and that both summer and winter active predators significantly really reduce the adelgid um, on both of those hemlock species in the West. So this gives us more information that probably we're gonna have to have something that feeds um, throughout the life cycle of the adelgid. And so what is it that's feeding on um, the adelgid throughout the life cycle in the West? It's these silver flies. So again, there are two species, Leucotaraxis argenticolis and Pinnaperda. Um, some of you that might know these, uh, this group uh, might've known these as in the genus Leucopus, but we recently um, did a study, uh, phy phylogenetic study with a taxonomist, Steve Daimari, and we put it into a new genus called Leucotaraxis. So I'm still getting used to saying that might slip, the other name might slip. Um, and together, these are the most abundant predators on Western hemlock woolly adelgid during both generations. So that original study I showed you 
the, the pie chart that was just beating trees. But if we actually take foliage into the lab and see what's feeding on them, we can find the immatures of these um, two species very abundant out west. Uh, another study that we did was we bagged them onto um, branches in eastern North America, so on the Japanese adelgid on eastern hemlock, because uh, we know that the adelgid and the trees are different in the west, so there is the question about whether these will feed on the Japanese adelgid, not the western adelgid, and they will. They will reproduce and feed uh, just fine. We did that study in New York and in Tennessee. And so these flies have started to be released starting in 2016. Um, so far about 2000 or 25,000 have been released um, through last year. Um, the majority of those have been released in, in New York, in New York State. Um, and actually they had the first confirmation of one of the species, uh, Leucotraxis argenticolis, um, overwintering near Ithaca, New York. So they had some flies in a bag. They took the bag off in the fall check that tree again in the spring, and they did find um, some immatures of uh, Leucotraxis argenticola. So I wouldn't call it established yet, but there is um, some promising uh, results saying that it could at least overwinter in New York. So this shows where they've been released since 2015. Um, there haven't been any um, real recoveries except for that one overwintering that I mentioned. Um, and again, most of the releases, most of the numbers have been up here. In, uh, in New York. So this just shows some, some pictures of what these look like. This is an egg, close-up of an egg. This is a, a larva um, feeding on hemlocally adelgid eggs. And this is a puparium. So they pupate right there on the branch. They don't go down into the soil. So um, the, the whole life cycle is, is, takes place right there on the tree. And a couple pictures of the adults. And for scale, this is what they look like. Uh, this was during one of the releases down in the south in Tennessee. Uh, they're about the size of a fruit fly, uh, little be little flies. So uh, what we do is uh, folks go out west and they collect hemlock branches. Um, this is Mark Whitmore up at Cornell. Uh, they go out and they find pockets of, uh, of good infestations of hemlock lily adelgid in the west. They bring it back into the lab. And you can put them in these bug dorms if you're out west um, and just wait for the adults to, uh, to emerge. So we have to wait for the adults to emerge. Of course, we don't want to release immatures because there are parasitoids um, that parasitize the larvae and the pupae of these species. So we wait for the adults to emerge, then we can um, release those here in the east. Uh, there's also been quite a bit of rearing, uh, that partial rearing going on at uh, the quarantine facility up at Cornell. So, of course, we don't want to release the Western hemlock lily adelgid also here in the East. We already have the Japanese one. So they're very careful about using these cages that the crawlers can't escape from and then doing it in quarantine and making sure everybody's all suited up and, and uh, trying to, to uh, keep it all safe, keep those parasitoids from re being released also. So this just shows just how abundant uh, these flies can be. So this is just one bug dorm. You know, you can imagine how much foliage can fit into a bug dorm. You can get thousands of flies uh, emerging um, from that material. And then the release strategy, what we've been doing in the East is to take um, a handful of males and females, put them in a bag, let them reproduce one generation, so that they can build up a little bit, then take the bag off and let them go. Um, we figure that's a little better than just releasing them out into the wild uh, so they don't have to find each other in that first generation anyway. But we do know actually that these two Leucotaraxis species are already present here in Eastern North America, feeding on pine bark adelgid. So why are we releasing the Western ones if the Eastern ones are already here? And the reason for that is that they're different. So it's the same species, uh, we did a molecular phylogeny of this new genus Leucotaraxis, and you can see that within each of the species, here's Pinnaperda, here's Argenticolis, that within each species there's a western clade and an eastern clade that are quite distinct from each other. And there's an eastern clade and a western clade within Argenticolis also that are distinct from each other. So the eastern flies we've only found on pine adelgids, the Western flies we found on hemlock adelgids and a few other Western adelgid species as well. 
So the eastern ones, that species is technically here, but there's a separate lineage that does not feed on hemlock lily adelgid. Again, probably because it's using post-plant cues to find the adelgid and it hasn't evolved um, the ability to do that yet. So then we decided to look at this in a little more detail. Um, this isn't published yet. This is some uh, new information where we use microsatellite, 15 microsatellite loci. Um, and we wanted to look at more uh, fine scale population structure um, within the, each species. So this sh shows Leucopus argenticolis. And you can see, so this is a structure plot, um, which, so each vertical bar is an individual insect and the colors represent the probability of being assigned to different clusters. So all of these individuals here that are in this red cluster are all grouped together. So you can see that again, we found this distinct east-west differentiation that the states are listed on the bottom. I don't, probably can't really see that from here, from there. Um, and the adelgid prey that they were collected on is shown on the top. So this red group are all Western flies and they were all collected on hemlock lily adelgid. This pinkish purple group are all the Eastern flies and also these same data are shown on the map as pie charts with the different colors and where they were located. Um, in the West though, however, we did find that there's additional population structure. So all the adelgids collected, or all the flies rather collected from hemlock adelgid clustered together. All the flies collected from adelgids on fur, on abies. So there's a balsam oli adelgid, which is also a non-native species. And then we have a native species called Pineus abiotinus in the West that feeds on fur. So those all clustered together. And all the adelgids collected, or all the flies collected on pine adelgids in the West also clustered together. So it seems like these really are specializing on different adelgid prey. Um, and of course, we wanna be careful to just introduce the flies collected from hemlock from the West to the East. Um, but this is also very encouraging um, uh, beyond the, the host range testing that was done in the lab that these are specific to particular adelgid prey. Uh, we found a similar story on Leucotraxis pinniperta in the West. Again, we have the, the distinct East-West uh, structure. And then in the West, we had fewer uh, samples that were collected from other adelgids other than um, hemlock lily adelgid. But the ones that were collected on fir adelgids or pine adelgids, there is some hint of uh, different structure on those ones. We, we may need more samples to really tease that out if there is additional structure between the fir and the pine um, feeding flies in the West. So another study very recently published in 2021 shows, uh, this is with, from Nick Deichler at Cornell and his colleagues, uh, they looked at the emergence of the three major predator species in Western North America, the, the timing of emergence. And you can see that they really do seem to um, partition themselves into different temporal niches in the West. So we get this, these are three different sites. I'll just focus on this one. You get a, an emergence first off of uh, Leucotraxis argenticolis, one of the flies, and then the, the beetles, Laracobius nigrinus, come out. And then you get an emergence of Leucotraxis pinniperta. And then you get a second emergence of uh, Leucotraxis argenticolis. So they really do seem to be spreading themselves across the life cycle of adelgid in this area where they've evolved with it um, and feeding on all different stages uh, of the adelgid life cycle. So it really does seem like, based on all this, uh, this information, that the likely key to biocontrol of hemlock woolly adelgid is sustained predation on both of the generations. That seems like it's really important. And so what we're trying to do is to get all of these different species established. So ones that feed on the spring generation would include Laraco the two Laracobia species. Um, there's one of the silver flies seem to feed mostly on the spring summer generation. And then we have the two species that feed on both hemlock woolly adelgid generations. Sasagi skimnasugi and Leucotraxis argenticolis. So just to summarize uh, where we're at with the current um, HWA biocontrol situation with this coordinated um, national and regional effort is that some of these classical biocontrol predators from Japan and Western North America have of course become established now. So we have Sasagi skimnasugi, Maricobius nigrinus and Osakensis. And then maybe Leucotraxis argenticolis. It's a little early to say for sure that it's, that it's really established, but there's a hint there. 
Um, unfortunately, to date, none of these have led to, to self-sustaining suppression of hemlock woolly adelgid below damaging levels in the eastern US. Um, and because we think it's because with this, this population rebound in the adelgid, we really do need an effective summer predator uh, to be going after that next generation. Um, we think that these leucotraxis silverflies show good promise um, for, for helping us out with that. And so really they're the current emphasis of the program we're really switching to um, learn more about and to get more of those released. Uh, thank you. I, I guess I have, I have two more slides I stuck on the end here. It looks like I have a few more minutes. I just wanted to mention that um, there are a couple of groups that are looking at uh, using eDNA for being able to, um, to detect both the hemlock woolly adelgid and the predators. So again, our colleague Mark Whitmore at Cornell is working with us to do this. So they're using water rinses of hemlock foliage, and they've developed assays for hemlock woolly adelgid and three of the three Western predators. Um, they're getting very concerned in the Adirondacks because the, the adelgid is spreading into there. So folks in New York uh, would use this adelgid eDNA to be able to have an early detection of when it's moving into certain areas. Um, similarly in Michigan, I mentioned that there's a recent introduction into Western Michigan. There's a group, Charlene Partridge at Grand Valley State University um, that developed an eDNA trap for hemocoli adelgid that's basically um, microscope slides covered with Vaseline petroleum jelly. And they just developed this cool um, 3D printed version of that trap. Uh, and they, they developed a really nice uh, eDNA assay for hemlock woolly adelgid uh, that they're using in Michigan to detect its spread. Okay, I'll go back to my thank you now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> We've got time for a few questions. Yeah, we don't. Um, we know that there's a, a relationship with adelgid density. So the, the more dense they are on a branch, the more winged forms they produce. Um, but we don't know the exact mechanism of, of what's causing that. Uh, it's, it would be real. So the, the adelgid in Western North America, as I said, we think it was, has been there for 36 plus or minus thousand years. Um, we used to think it didn't produce that winged form at all, but we've since found a few. <laughs> so, so it almost doesn't produce the winged form at all because there's no suitable spruce. And so you'd think that trait would be lost really quickly by evolution because those just go out and die. So it does seem like, um, I think it's not really answering your question, but I think it's kind of cool that, that uh, in Western North America, we see we've almost, the adelgids have almost lost that ability to produce the winged form. They still have it in the East because they're coming from a holocyclic population in Japan, but it will be interesting to see if that decreases over time um, as the adelgid is here without a suitable host. Yeah. So um, my impressions from Carol Cheetah there's been a lot more recovery of the Costanelic predator than it, it seems like it's been presented here. Um, is, uh, is, there, is there some reason why that um, that's not in, in the, the statistics? Yeah, it, so you can recover it, but at very low numbers. So um, and I think Carol would probably agree with that. So it's, it's out there. Um, but you can't really get enough, be there aren't enough beetles to really show evidence that they're having an impact on the adelgid. So it's on the landscape, but at very low numbers. Yeah. So how, so how does the the spread without the They do, yeah. So, so right after they hatch from the eggs, there's this crawler stage. That's the only mobile stage beside the wing form. So they crawl around and they can get blown around on the wind. Um, they hitch rides on birds. There have been a couple studies that have you know misnetted birds. And back in the day, a study that was done here, they could dunk them in soapy water. You can't do that anymore. But they, um, yeah. So they they definitely get around on on birds and and by wind. 
um, and any other kind of, you know, somebody thought that they were getting around on UPS trucks as they <laughs> drove by, <laughs> you know, so they can, yeah, it's that crawler stage that, that is, uh, you know, it's very light. They can get moved around. They can hitch rides pretty easily. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So uh, yeah, um, chemical control is very effective at the individual tree level, and it's not so much spraying. You can spray horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps. That's kind of difficult because you really have to drench the tree to be able to kill the indulgence. Um, but there are systemic pesticides that folks are using quite a bit, the milcoprid and um, dinotefron. And, um, and for example, like in Michigan, where there's the new introduction, they're really trying to slow down the spread of the adelgid. So they're treating a lot of trees with systemic pesticides to slow it down. Um, in like also in Great Smoky Mountain National Park and other national parks, they're treating a lot of trees in, you know, it's, it, they'll treat some of the big specimen trees or a few trees in a stand or the larger kind of mother trees in a stand um, to try to slow things down. So, yeah. Bobby, are there any questions online? Okay, well, I got a question. Uh, yeah. I forgot to even ask you the other day. Is there any interaction or synergy or disconnect between the scale and the adulthood? Is there two introduced species that almost seem to fluctuate? Which one's on top? Yeah, it, that, that's a good question. There's been some work um, by the folks at University of Rhode Island that have looked at that. And they, they found some hints that, yeah, the, the I don't know if I'm going to get this right. Talbot might be able to correct me, but the this adelgid might do better on, uh, no, I don't remember. Yeah, there is an interaction <laughs> between <laughs> scales and adelgids. Um, and I can't quite remember what that interaction is. You remember what it was, it, Talbot, was it? Right. Yeah, so Talbot um, said that it, there seems to be an interaction. The adelgid comes out on top, um, but it depends on who gets there first. So there, there it does seem to be an effect of the two species on each other mediated by the, the plant's um, chemical defenses. Um, so it depends on you know, when and which defenses get activated by the, by the insects. Yeah, Doug, sorry, Monica. I was gonna defer to Blair. Yeah, Blair, you can go. <laughs> so this kind of research is way, way inside my nose. And so the closest thing I can think of is like the episode of the Simpsons where that group is six. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my question is just like, do we have a good example of how people are working or like, where does it successfully Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we do have good examples of it working. Um, so there's a, there's a moth called winter moth. Um, that's kind of like the big success story with a forest insect that um, folks point to. It's a European species that was introduced uh, first into Canada, Eastern Canada, then Western Canada, then um, it showed up in Massachusetts recently. And uh, that's a case where they brought over um, some parasitoids from Europe and it just took care of it. Um, in that case, you know, it was controlled in, in Canada um, 50 to 100 years ago, and then it popped up in Massachusetts and it's moved into um, Eastern Connecticut. And uh, our colleague, Joe Elkington, brought those, uh, that parasitoid, the most effective parasitoid from Nova Scotia down to Massachusetts. And he, he's confident saying that it has controlled winter moth in, in that region now. Um, in the case of adelgids, um, the balsam woolly adelgid is another big pest and lots of predators were released for that and that was not effective. Um, but there are some pine adelgids where silver flies are reported to have been effective in controlling those pine adelgids um, in Hawaii and New Zealand. Again, that's a place where pines aren't native <laughs> so it's a little bit different, but there is some evidence that these silver flies could be um, good controls. And yeah, there, there are other examples. There's, um, you know, with, with spongy moth, there's a, a, a fungus that is actually um, pretty good control. You know, it's, it's definitely dampened down the, the big outbreaks of, the, um, of that pest. And so it's, you know, it's, um, it doesn't always work, of course. 
and we have to make sure what we reduce we're introducing is not going to be like that episode of the Simpsons it's going to you know cause another problem we have to make sure that they're uh, going to be specific just to that pest which we do with these um, these uh, particular predators uh, and we also want to try to introduce something that we think is going to be effective have some evidence that it might be effective rather than like the olden days they would just take everything that feeds on it in the native range and introduce it um, so yeah th there have been some um, success stories and the good thing is it's relatively cheap you know if you can get it out there and it's just self-sustaining and takes care of itself so it's always this kind of um, you know cost benefit analysis when we're doing this kind of thing if i can just really quick i was going to say i think one of the things you were hinting at is it really seems like you need a suite of parasitoids pairs and predators it's not just one uh, king toads in africa sort of releasing, but you want some, everything that's a little bit effective. So overall you get, you get your control. Yeah, yeah, often that's the case, yeah. Um, so <laughs> you believe the hemlocks and have some natural immunity or some natural immunity. Yeah. Um, do we see natural defenses in the Western? Um, yeah yeah um yeah so it seems like so if you if you plant the um the japanese southern japanese hemlock which is the where we got the adelgid from in the east if you plant that here um it actually can build up pretty big numbers but the tree doesn't seem to be as impacted by those numbers as Eastern hemlocks are. So it's, they seem to be pretty good at, um, at, at just, uh, you know, they're, they're fine having high numbers <laughs> on, in that case. Um, and we do know that there are a lot of predators in Japan that are feeding on it. So it's top up and bottom down. Um, and the Western uh, hemlock um, is, is pretty resistant to the Japanese adelgid. So again, we're, we're kind of mixing and matching adelgids and trees from different places. Uh, and, and we're starting to get a better uh, program going to look at natural immunity in Eastern hemlock. Um, I was just talking to Jeff the other day and, and there are sites all over the place, including in Connecticut, where the adelgid just went through and killed 95, 99% of the hemlocks in a stand, um, but a few are surviving. and so. There's going to be more of an effort to try to um, look for that natural immunity in eastern um, hemlock and maybe do some resistance breeding. There's also been some resistance. And so the Chinese hemlocks seem to be immune to the Japanese adelgid, again, the one we have here. So up like up at Arnold Arboretum, there are a lot of Chinese hemlocks planted and you can't find an adelgid on them, even though they're having Japanese adelgids rain down on them. So, um, so there was a, uh, some work early on at the National Arboretum to try to cross our Eastern hemlocks with Chinese hemlocks to try to get some resistant lines. Um, unfortunately, Eastern hemlock, Suga canadensis, doesn't cross with the, China, with the Asian hemlocks. It's just too far away phylogenetically. Um, but uh, Carolina hemlock will hybridize with the Asian hemlocks. Um, and so there are some hybrids out there. So, so yeah, there's some folks have been looking at differences in susceptibility and in resistance um, to the adelgid in these different species, and, and also hopefully a little bit more effort within eastern hemlock now. Yeah. So at the Arnold Arboretum, do you have plantings with the Japanese hemlock? I mean, I would think that you would want to actually not allow Japanese hemlock to be yeah. supported or, or planted that could support large populations of adelgid. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it supports it as well as Eastern hemlock. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there, there are some of those uh, Japanese hemlocks planted around in Arnold, Arnold Arboretum and other places. I don't think it's really much of a source of prolonging the adelgid. Um, one interesting thing is they do have the primary host, Picea Toronto, planted at Arnold Arboretum. And we've looked on that for galls for the rest of the life cycle, and, and we didn't find it. I mean, we really scoured the trees with bucket trucks and things. Um, and it's a similar situation in Japan when we've looked for that other part of the life cycle. Some stands of the spruce species 
have the rest of the life cycle and some don't. So maybe there's variation within that species that allows it. So we actually have not found um, that sexual form of the adelgid in North America yet. And there are a handful of places where you can find that spruce species, including a great mountain forest here in Connecticut and Arnold Arboretum and various arboreta. And we've asked around and we've looked ourselves and we've never found the galls here in North America. So it does just keep reproducing asexually um, uh, on hemlock. And we, we did find actually that the whole north, Northeastern uh, US has a single clone of hemlock lily adelgid. So it's, it's, there's no evidence that it is reproducing sexually at all in the East. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time.